Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Enting and this is Shamila. Uh, we are both on the CA team for the Effective Altruism Debate Tournament. And today we're going to be prepping two motions to show, uh, related to global health. And we're going to show you how to use the material from Seller's Global Health Lectures to prep these motions. The first motion we're going to prep is a motion from Chennai Worlds. It's the motion, this house would make the receipt of welfare payments to raise children conditional on the use of long-term but reversible contraception. We're going to go through the proposition arguments first and then we'll go through the opposition arguments. So we'll start with the proposition for this motion. And I think upon looking at this motion, my first question would be, so what exactly is the problem this motion is trying to solve? So I think the premise of this debate is resources are limited, obviously, and how do we maximize uh, the allocation of resources and which interventions are likely to be most effective? Um, I think we're probably also talking about countries that perhaps don't have the most optimal resource distribution systems that are probably already struggling to get welfare payments to everybody, let alone uh, families with large numbers of children. Yeah, and yeah. so we want to think of some way to make that resource allocation a bit more efficient and a bit more effective. Also taking into account that this is quite targeted because the population skew is such that uh, individuals in lower socioeconomic classes tend to have relatively higher, a higher number of children for, for reasons that we can chat about. But yeah, so that's targeted at them. Yeah, so I think there are a number of reasons we can give here, right? So we can talk about uh, how women in the lower socioeconomic classes sometimes have difficulties educating, uh, accessing education. Uh, they have difficulties accessing contraception, so they might not be making a free and fair choice about the number of children they're having. Uh, and they often tend to get married earlier as well, so that also uh, increases the childbearing responsibilities in some conservative areas. Yeah, okay. Um... So if I that's mean, the, mm -hmm, go. No, no, go, go. It's okay. okay so ahead. if that's the problem, what are we going to defend? What are we actually setting up as our policy here? Because I think we need to model this quite carefully or we're going to be hit with a number of attacks about how this is going to be ineffective. Yeah, so I think if people have two kids, which is usually the replacement rate of the population or the average number of kids per family, that's fine, right? Like, so I mm -hmm. think this model kicks in after that. So welfare payments before that should be unconditional on this. But the moment you've had two kids, um, perhaps in order to be able to access more welfare payments, you need to demonstrate that you are using um, long-term reversible contraception. So if we're talking about a couple, then either one in the, uh, in the couple, so IUDs or the injection or a vasectomy, which is also uh, reversible, right? Um, yeah. And I think yeah. we need to make sure that we can provide this long-term uh, reversible yeah. interception to yeah. individuals for free, pretty much, as well as educating them on what the possible yeah. consequences and side effects are so that we can get them to make a free and informed decision. Um, yeah, I think that's probably about it, right? And if they choose at any point to have more than two children, we will then stop the welfare payments for the for raising the children. I think we can say that most people are sensible and if they choose to have more children after their first two children, they'll do it once those first two children are probably grown up or they are less in need of welfare payments. Yeah, so at the very least, you know, like as because it is long term as well, right? Yes. So they're, they're not good. And it's unlikely that it'll be an accidental pregnancy. It's going to be something that they would have given a lot of thought to as well. Mm. Okay. Uh, and we'll say if there are any accidental pregnancies, do we need to model in anything for that? So I think if if they've already like demonstrated that they are using long term contraception, then that's not their fault anymore. Right? Yes, like I, I don't think. Yeah, I don't think we should withhold payments in those situations. And okay. I mean, obviously, if there are exceptional cases where you're allergic to the contraception or unable to for some reason, then then this won't apply. Let's okay, assume so a reasonable up, yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, so I think that's a very comprehensive yeah. policy. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've already gone through who this makes the most impact to. It's going to impact uh, women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds like the most, probably women from developing countries as well, because developing countries' birth rates tend to be significantly higher than the birth rates of developed countries. And of course, that's region-specific as well, but I think we can say as a general yeah. rule, probably women from these two groups. Okay, so how exactly does this help us make welfare distribution more effective or more utile overall? 
Okay, so I mean, the empirical data does show that um, the fewer kids there are in a family that needs welfare, the more effective uh, welfare payments are, right? Like um, in terms of health and nutritional outcomes for these kids, but also in terms of the subjective well being. Um, shout out to Sela's lecture <laughs> that uh, <laughs> women have in these families because that does mean lower burdens of care, lower um, uh, domestic responsibilities and child care responsibilities. Um, also maternal health, the more pregnancies you have, the more dangerous they are. And the older women are when they have these pregnancies, um, the more likely it is that there will be pregnancy related complications. So all of these things do have an impact on health spending and people's well-being. And we we'll want to keep in mind that welfare payments are rarely enough for a family to live in luxury. Yes. So even aside from welfare payments, there are other things that the family must pay for. And the fewer yeah. amounts you have to distribute between, uh, likely the more impact the money has. So if you have only two children or you have fewer than two children, you can make a choice to send both of your children to educate, like to get educated rather than ensuring that the elder child needs to be home to yeah. take care of the younger siblings or making the decision to only send some of your children to school rather than yeah. others, which also guarantees the child's long-term outcomes because I think there's a lot of research done that shows education really improves your prospects for job opportunities and later quality of life. Yeah, so in a way, what we are doing here actually by making it conditional is we are making all those other interventions and resources also more impactful. Mm. Um, or, or at least putting the family in a better position to access those resources as well, like send, the, send their kids to school. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I do think... think mm -hmm. ah, no, I was going to say, I, I do think there is a... Uh, an argument here about um, unmet need for contraception as well. So it is widely documented that in many of these situations, uh, the expressed preference of the women involved is actually to have fewer kids. Um, but because of a lag in terms of access to services or contraception, or because of cultural norms that uh, pressure women into having more kids because of associations of masculinity with virility and things like that, um, they don't get access to the contraception. So what happens now is aid agencies are actually in a way taking the hit by um, making it conditional uh, and changing incentive structures in the community. That's very good. So we actually destigmatize women who are asking for contraception as well, thus leading to more effective contraceptive intervention, because I think that's a thing that quite a lot of charities are also trying to do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We can frame it like that. Yes. Okay. I think we should. <laughs> All right. Um, and I think that is actually most of what we need for proposition. So now we're prepping up. What are we then defending on up? So um, I think we need to say there are a number of other effective interventions that we can make. So I assume Proposition is going to talk about things like how welfare isn't distributed well enough amongst children, children aren't getting good educational or nutritional outcomes. So I think what we want to say is no matter how many kids uh, people end up having, we think they should be allowed to have those children and we will take the money that would otherwise go into providing long-term contraception and enforcing this policy into uh, early childhood intervention to ensure children have good outcomes. So in Seller's lecture, he actually talks about this really cool organization called the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, which tries to eradicate tapeworms in children by putting uh, medication in their food in their water in schools and that actually yeah. does a lot to improve their educational outcomes as well as their long-term job opportunity outcomes plus their nutritional outcomes so I think we can say we will do things like that that are minimally intrusive yeah. but also have a lot of bang for the buck and you know we, we can bite the bullet we can say no matter how many kids a family has um, you know what we will still fund the, those kids because we have mm. a duty to those kids and we're yes. playing the long game here by investing in those interventions you've talked about and education which has you know demonstrable effects on uh birth rates later on so yeah, yeah um so i think that's the stance we take that that we um 
we're committed to funding these families regardless of the number of kids. That being said, I still think we should say we will have contraception available Ah, um, and that we should have education about contraceptive options available so that people really are making the decision to have kids, which I think takes out a lot of propositions, arguments about how people are coerced. And we kind of just like have to frame this as intergenerational interventions yes uh, that the uptake and the buy-in for the message on contraceptions might not be a contraception use might not be as strong in this generation but definitely will be in later generations if we include everything else everything else you said cool awesome so, okay how i mean how are they likely to characterize the problem here i assume there will be a lot of assumptions about a micro analysis of aid effectiveness within a household, right? Like presumably they will talk about how resources are allocated within a household, how welfare is not enough um, for full consumption needs in the first place, but plus other hidden costs associated with education, et cetera, et cetera. So, So it's going to be like your basic efficiency argument, fewer kids, more impactful. So how do we intervene in this? How do we flip this? So I think, first of all, we can point out that our welfare payments can scale with each child. So it isn't as though it is always going to be a fixed amount for a growing family. I mean, admittedly, it will be true that we can't give as much per child. But I think we push back against the worst characterizations coming from proposition on this. Um, And I also think we want to point out that it's not always the case that allocation within households is bad. Because very often when a can, we can say that a can be distributed directly to the mother because lots of studies have shown that when aid is distributed to the mother or the woman in the household, all the outcomes go to the children as opposed to if you distribute it to the male figure where money then gets spent on things like pursuing his interests or cigarettes or alcohol. I think we did this in quite a number of countries and the pattern held true in all of them so we can in some ways nudge towards better outcomes. Yeah, and so I think in terms of how they've characterized uh, cultural predispositions towards like more kids, right? Or many factors go into this. Like in some cases, there's an economic reason for having more kids because that might be increased labor. In some cases, we might not find it rational, but there's the whole like, the more kids I have, it's kind of like gambling and a few of them are going to succeed and lift the entire family out of poverty. And you, we can't like just undo yes, this is a lot of these beliefs, right? So, so there's like an implicit assumption on their side that the policy is going to be effective. But what they probably are going to be afraid to admit and we need to push them hard on is, mm. if it is not effective, you are literally committing to punishing the succeeding kids. This by withholding welfare from them, right? And um, the presumed buy-in that they are they have for this policy, I'm just like not persuaded is something, you know, that we can just take for granted in the debate. I think we push back hard on that. This is fair. I think we can also perhaps point to things like the one-child policy, um, where people were really trying to find all kinds of loopholes around it, as yeah. well as lots of um, actually really gender biased positions yes. about the kinds of children they were having. So that does lead yeah. to lots of long-term population impacts as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So so we've identified like some of the unintended consequences of their policy, right? Like sound preference, um, mm. making I can making the family worse off because if their premise is more kids equals more poverty and more suffering, and the solution is more kids equals less health, less welfare. So <laughs> there's a problem solution mismatch there. Yes. Um, what In fact, is our this pa- works much better because our interventions yeah. are actually okay. really scalable. That, that was my next the question. You read my mind. <laughs> I was like, what is our path to victory then? <laughs> well done. Continue. <laughs> Okay, so our interventions are scalable because we are looking for interventions that are really minimal in cost. So things like medication, uh, which don't add that much more onto costs for welfare payments, but can be very easily distributed to lots of kids. So preventative things, um, immunizations, malaria nets, vaccinations, all of these things that ensure that the children grow up to have like a better shot at life compared to a world where they are excluded from their welfare system and probably excluded from the formal education system, which is how we would otherwise reach them. Yeah, so I think the education point, we actually really try to own that and say there are many hidden costs to education, um, transport fees, you know, the pocket money for the kid, money to, to, uh, I don't know, submit projects, whatever, uniforms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So if we remove welfare payments, that's probably one of the first things the family will have to cut 
and mm. kids will have to perform like labor, right? Uh, and education is the best way to reach these kids with um, information about contraception in the future. So mm. in a way, actually, we are the ones disrupting the cycle, not them. They're yeah. just like being strangely punitive. Uh, yes. is how we frame this, I think. <laughs> yes, and I think we say that if they can have the political capital to do this, we can have the political capital to do all this contraceptive education and distribution in schools. Yeah. Once and, they get to like teenagehood. I mean, there are, there's an ethical argument here of like re reproductive coercion, which mm. they can make on their side. I mean, which, sorry, which can be made about like women being forced to under uh, to use contraception when they don't have to. Obviously, this this cuts both ways in this debate, but the yes. risk of but but the risk of forced abortion falls with us. Cause like if now there is a cost to having that third kid, then this is true. Yeah. Which we okay. kind of yeah. So we can establish that as well. Okay, so lots of unintended consequences for this yeah. policy that are pretty bad. They don't achieve their actual intended outcomes and we get significantly better interventions on our side that are excluded yeah. from theirs. Yep, cool. Okay, awesome. So the motion we're going to be discussing is, this house believes that the medical community should invest in anti-aging research on the same scale as other top priorities including cancer or heart disease research. And we're going to start with proposition first before moving on to opposition. So on proposition, um, if I'm looking at this motion, my first question would be, what exactly is the problem we are trying to solve here? I mean, aging is aging, right? Like everyone does it. So I think we want to problematize aging and um, put it on the same scale or framework as all these other diseases that we seem to prioritize. I suspect we draw on things like there's a general social consensus that you know death is undesirable, but not just death, the process leading up to death and aging itself is quite undesirable. It makes you vulnerable to diseases. It increases your discomfort in life and your quality of life significantly. Um, it uh, drops you of your dignity. It increases burdens of care for other members of your family towards you. Um, so what else about aging? Mm. I think it also dramatically narrows the scope of life you are able to leave. So activities mm. that were once available to you are no longer yeah. available. Uh, entertainments that were once available are no longer so. So you can make an argument that quality of life has significantly dropped by the time you enter, say, late 60s and onwards. So this might be a good time to introduce Qualis. Sell yes. us. <laughs> Sell us lecture. Um, yes. Do you want to? Okay, I don't have the definition. It's okay, it's okay. Um, so it's from Seller's lecture. Um, Qualies, and uh, you should watch this because he gives a significantly more comprehensive definition with a lot of case studies for how it's calculated. Uh, basically refers to the number of healthy or quality years that are added as a uh, in terms of life extended once you have a medical intervention. Seller really explains this much better, but that's yeah. the general idea. So we we uh, underpin the case with that. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, maybe I, I think we should also just like point out that it isn't just about the quantity of your life. So we want to explicitly differentiate this from life prolonging medical treatments. Yeah. I think yeah. we can say that research, you know, already exists, but what we're specifically talking about is stuff to add the quality back into the quantity of life. And I think that's really important because that's where OP is going to hit us. I imagine that they will really try to blur the distinction between anti-aging and just prolonging life quality, right? Like, yeah. So I think it's probably important to characterize what this research looks like and what yes. the potential benefits of it are. Now, obviously, some of it is quite speculative, which is exactly why we need to invest in it. But yes. like the whole like tissue regeneration and slowing down, if not even reversing the aging process is so different mm. to like, you know, the palliative care or like prolonging life by just a few years that exists at the Agreed. moment. Agreed. So really focusing on the fact that this is more like stem cell research, um, really focusing on how to slow or even halt the aging process in what your telomeres, right? Whatever bits of your cell that tell you you are aging. And I think we want to point out this also probably underpins some bits of cancer research or yeah. some bits of heart uh, disease research. So we co-opt some of their benefits as well on our side. Yes, yeah. I think we can try. Um, organ replacement, organ replacement is a thing. We can talk about that as well. Um, cool. 
I think maybe one more th one last thing in framing, um, we will point out that while there has been funding, we will acknowledge it's a lot more speculative than other parts. And that is precisely why we need more research in order to better understand. Yeah, and also, so, the, I, I, I wonder if there's a way to flip what I expect them to say, what I expect us to say, <laughs> which is that there's a lot of private interest in this already, which is there's a reason for this to be led by the medical community in general and for there to be public investment in this. Because if we accept that it is valuable research, then it needs to be accessible to everyone. And mm. so we kind of want the research to be produced by a wider range of actors as well. So the yes. benefits become accessible. Yes, I think that's really good. Okay, so we've covered the harm. We've covered roughly what we're standing for and what this is going to look like. So what are the direct benefits that we can end up claiming? I think the first one is just really obvious, right? It goes back to the idea of qualities. If we can succeed in this, our best case scenario is just massive improvement in quality adjusted life years for a huge swathe of the population. Um, in fact, yeah. for everybody, because aging is something yes. that does eventually happen to everyone. So essentially, we have infinity benefits. So in a way, even if the research is in a more speculative stage, exactly, the payoff is actually mm. broader. Um, yes. And not just to the individual involved, like, but also like the people around them, because it reduces like burdens on the rest of society of caring for the elderly. Uh, and the financial costs thereof as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, this this actually is a bit of a catch-all kind of discovery or like research that reduces costs all around. And probably is even really good for gendered labor because usually caring for the elderly is something that falls to women within the households. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so lots of direct benefits if we're able to do this. Okay, so OP is going to try and push a trade-off, right? They're going to say, but if you do this, you invest less in other forms of research. Why are we okay with that? So yeah, I think I think we we probably should be honest about what the trade-off is without letting them push us around too much. Mm. So it's not oh I so we're doing a lot of the defensive stuff already by saying that it is very likely that there are knock-on effects of this uh, research on on the very things that they care about, right? And I think we should like hold that line. But I think fine, we should be willing to concede that because this research is still a bit more speculative than the state of their research, um, there is going to be lag time. And there is perhaps a little bit more uncertainty in terms of like the outcomes mm. that might be generated. Um, and so that might lead to a slowing down of the research they want to do or somehow the, re the research they want to do being less accessible. Like I feel that we may just have to really bite that bullet. But then, I mean, go is back it possible? to- is it possible for us to say that cancer and heart disease are really well-established areas of research? And so the marginal benefits of pumping in more money into already very well-explored fields is just going to be significantly less than the marginal benefits of pumping more money into a relatively under-explored field where there are, whereas there is the possibility of significant discovery. So even if we accept that we cop some loss in terms of access or in terms of new discoveries, those losses are unlikely to be groundbreakingly significant yeah. unlike yeah. the research on our side i think so i think we can do that as well so the whole like in some ways there is a bit of diminishing marginal utility at least for some cancers or some of the more widely um applicable research. ones yeah 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 i think that's good yeah okay um are there any side effect benefits that we haven't discussed already i think these are all the direct medical benefits as well as the trade-offs i know we mentioned healthcare. Um, and the division of labor for healthcare. Is there anything else we are not considering yet? I suspect subjective well being mm. in general. Like, so mental health is a bit under discussed in a lot of these debates about health, but it's really, really important. And I think a big source of like anxiety, depression, sadness, people experience is aging, death, um, losing loved ones. in um sooner than you know you should be uh which this can also i suppose address in some way potentially we could claim that anti-aging research isn't just physical yeah we could claim it's mental yeah. as well things like alzheimer's and then explain all the mental effects of that as well yeah so i think that's something else actually so yeah uh the mental 
degeneration is being addressed by our, our anti-aging research uh, quite underexplored field. And the mm -hmm. other one is like the mental health effects of uh, yes. aging as a social reality. So I think those are two distinct things mm -hmm. we can claim. Yeah. yeah, so the, the um, social reality mental effect of aging really ties back to our original characterization yes. of aging significantly robbing you of dignity, choices, yeah. and ability to engage with the world around you. And the intersubjectivity of it, like people are sad yeah. when people age. Yeah, we can, we can do this. We can, we can narrative okay, yes. this in some ways. <laughs> narrative this. Okay, and I think that's the prop case. Yeah, cool. Okay, we're now prepping up. So obviously the distinction is prop is saying, let's uh, prioritize these things equally, whereas we are saying, no, some things are more important than others, right? So what are we defending here? So I um, think we want to defend pumping in significant amounts of public funding into cancer or heart disease research. Claiming it's yeah. a top priority probably means the bulk of our researchers will be dedicated to this field. The bulk of publicly granted medical funding goes into this. And I think we justify by saying, uh, there are many varieties of cancer um, and then all these varieties of cancer plus heart disease uh, impact a tremendous number of people. Just huge. Yeah, across um, different age groups too. And demographics, yeah. Um, and then I think we will say anti-aging research still happens, just happens in a private capacity. Yeah, and I, and I think it shouldn't be hard for us to demonstrate an incentive on the part of private individuals, like a lot of them who have money Yes, don't want they to will age. want to live so, forever. Yeah, Please, and in fact, they have the been. Money. Yeah, they've been throwing huge sums at this. So okay, um, I guess let's do a check of what are the likely assumptions the other side is gonna make about anti aging research. What assumptions will they make about the research environment, and where, like, how do we flip those? Where do we stand on those? Um, um, okay, so I think Gub is going to say anti aging research is going to work. I think we need to really push back on that and just say anti-aging research at the moment is a pipe dream. It is yeah. highly speculative. All research yeah. right now, it's not even at the human stage. It's on it's on like the animal testing stage and animals are different from humans, like genetically and in body structure and everything. Yeah. So we'll I also say, mm. No, yeah, this fantasy of like, oh, immortality yeah. or um suddenly we're eliminating aging. I, I just like think needs to be thrown out of the debate quickly. Mm. Um, yes. I think we will just point out that most of the current anti-aging stuff actually just looks like prolonging being old yes. and prolonging your period of not dying as opposed to actually improving your quality of life as an old person. So I think uh, framing wise, probably it's good for us to recognize on some level that there's a potential for it to be a bit more than that. But I think that specific frame is really useful for us and we could just like keep strategically deploying it and going, this is prolonging life. <laughs> uh, not necessarily quality of life always, right? Yes. So highly speculative, uh, unclear what the payoff is and um, probably looks like things like just constant hip replacements and you know yeah. all these things that uh patch up one part of your aging body but doesn't really deal with the body uh holistically so the yeah. moment you replace one part the other part like breaks down so unclear also how significantly uh the significant the departure is from what we already have right yes um so I think Gov okay. is going to argue that pumping huge amounts of money in uh, changes the research environment, right? It makes these speculative benefits far more likely to actually come true if you have a dedicated team working on it. Um, I think we can push back on that quite a bit, right? We have a lot yeah. of private funding. Private yeah. funding usually um, is just better than government funding for quite a lot of research purposes. Yeah, it's like very dedicated teams. Like, and, I mean, look, and even if, right, even if, I think we also need to make them defend the flip, which is like cancer or heart disease research. I imagine they are probably going to try to suggest our fairly far along and well-developed fields. And I think we just really contest that. And we're like, yep. there's so many unknowns um, in terms of understanding the causes of a lot of these things. And also... Mm. Um, cures and treatments, especially for more aggressive types of cancers. Yes. And stuff. Yeah. Like what we currently have is really bad. Like chemo has so many side yeah. effects. There's a lot to be done with trying to make treatments better. So really pushing them on the trade-off is very important. Yeah. So we do a lot of that. Um, and then 
maybe we can clean up the stakeholders here because I imagine there's going to be a bit about like, oh, everyone is affected by aging. And then that kind of becomes an analytical shortcut for them to show, therefore, this benefits more people. Mm. So, so we need to clean up what the stakeholders look like, how they're actually affected, and then like introduce this metric of ours. So I think, first of all, we can break the everyone is affected by anti-aging research thing. Because realistically, uh, most people who are, not everyone is going to access this, right? First of all, it's going to be primarily accessed by people who are already old, but want to prolong their life. Which, by the way, yeah. it's just not every old person. Like, there is yeah, no consensus yeah. that being old and actually dying a natural death is necessarily a bad thing. So it's only yeah. a specific subset of old people that then access this, yeah? Yeah. Agreed. And also, I mean, the clearly this benefit kicks in for people who are at like older, right? Like, mm. whereas re research on cancer and heart disease benefits even younger people, because there's a yes. spread of people who are affected by this um, across demographics. So what do we do with this information? How do we weaponize this? So I think we can take it all the way back um, to this idea of quali. Watch Seller's video for a definition yeah. of what quali is. Um, and I think we can point out that if you're saving the life of a person who is 25 um, and then enabling them to lead a happy and healthy life all the way until they are 80 or 90, that makes a significantly larger difference than saving the life of somebody who is 75 and then prolonging their life enough for them to live until 80. I mean, yeah. there is a huge thing there, right? I mean, first of all, we can point out that prolonging from 75 to 80 doesn't do that much in terms of quality. So when you're thinking about it in terms of quality adjusted life years added, it's not very high. And second of all, if you're just thinking about it in terms of life added, 25 to 80 is obviously a huger jump than 75 to 80. Yeah, absolutely. So I think there's more... Um in terms of qualities, in terms of equity as well, uh, mm -hmm. kind of just easier to justify why this is the priority. Uh, I wonder if, like, as, say if we were extending here, there might be space to argue that somehow anti-aging research, the, benefit, the results of that uh, are just not going to be as accessible or are more likely to be ac accessed by wealthier individuals mm. than the benefits of research on heart and um, cancer, uh, heart disease and cancer. Well, one, by virtue of there are just fewer people affected by that, but obviously the effects on them are huge. So therefore, easier for those fewer people to access it um, and the ripple effects on their communities. But also, um, I wonder if there's a way to massage this idea of social norms, where anti-aging is just not seen as, as prop concedes, right? They will have to, where anti-aging is just not seen as, essen as essential or as important as like life-saving uh, life treatments or I think that's really care. true. Yeah. Um, and I think the way we do this is by pointing out the immediacy of the impact. So if we yeah. go back to our characterization about how anti-aging research is more likely to look like just pushing back your death date by a few years, there, there is no actual concrete way to measure that, right? Because you can't yeah. really say without this, you would definitely have died at this year. Yes. And therefore we yes. are adding this. So it's very wishy-washy in terms of how you're justifying the exact impact to people. Um, whereas it's something like heart disease or cancer, I think it's very immediate, it's very impactful and people are conditioned to already think of it as an extremely deadly disease, uh, which is why it's currently top priority. Yeah, so I think what we what we can do here is say, look, assuming a world where you know both uh, forms of research are successful, uh, one of them is just going to be way more accessible, and it's easier to make a case for providing people access to one of them than the other. So just inherently anti-aging research is going to be more accessible to wealthy individuals, whereas these other types of research are going to be accessible across the board. So there's an equity argument here. Mm. Um, Perhaps which, the other equity argument angle that we want to bring in is the, is the youth equity argument. Surely yeah. it is better to help individuals who have not had the potential, like ability yes. to live the rest of their potential life and gain all of those life experiences, which prop concedes are valuable, which is why they yeah. want to extend life, compared yeah. to extending the life of a person who can yep. still 
not engage in these life experiences yeah. fully, but has already experienced them once. Yeah. So essentially, we are in some ways buying the qualis frame, but we're saying it works more for us, which is which is mm. good. Um, yeah. So so by it, so, so just to recap, in terms of metrics, we do share a lot of their metrics in terms mm. of quality of life, but we just have a different calculus of of equity or yes. how that plays out given the stakeholders involved here. Yes. Um, and I yeah. think we do a lot more with characterization as well about what this research is likely to look like right now and which directions it's likely to go in. So, And I mean, to be fair, there might be actually room for us to play with the characterization of cancer and heart disease research, where we say that in some cases, it is still quite an underexplored field, but in other mm. cases, we are very close to breakthroughs, which is probably uh, yes. closer to the truth. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So revisiting our original assumption, we can complicate that a bit. That allows us then to like claim certain benefits, as, some benefits as like easier to already achieve, and then some benefits are still like not quite there yet, but then but therefore needing need more the investment. input yeah. of money. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Yes. And I think that's the off case.